No, you're not crazy. There is a lot of Mormon true crime. And today's story, it had me jumping out of my seat when I heard the villain in the story saying my catchphrase. Which is, if you think that, then you don't know Mormon theology. So if you think that you've heard this case, I promise you, unless you know Mormon theology and history and fundamentalist doctrine, then you do not know this story. So I like to tell the podcast versions of these stories so that they're safe for the Mormons, verifiable for the ex-Mormons, and compelling enough for the never-Mormons. I have a request of you, though. Will you comment, rate, review, like, subscribe, whatever it is on your platform of choice and make the 144,000 happy. Appreciate ya. Awesome. So this episode really challenged me as an ex-Mormon in the fact that I recently did the Jan Broberg case and both this story and Jan Broberg's case, they really talked about how the church was something that it gave them something to focus on, to ground on, to really help them through something that was really, really terrible that happened to them for an extended period of time. And so while I am an ex-Mormon who believes that the Mormon beliefs and theology is verifiably false, it made it really difficult because I believe in believing victims. And when victims say that the church helped them through something that's very, very traumatic, it made me like sit there like, oh, where is the nuance on this? Where is the line? Where is, you know, how do I make these conflicting views jive? And I I don't have answers for that. So maybe you, you might have some insight on how you feel about that after you listen to this story. But it's been a really interesting journey with this one in particular. So Here's my problem with that question, though, and something that I want you to contemplate is, did, uh, you know, if Mormonism is the thing that they were able to focus on to help them through these challenges, where's the balance in that if Mormonism set them up to become the prey to these predators? I don't know the answer to that right now, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. So this story, I first heard about it when I was 14. It was 2002. And uh, there was a kidnapping. There was a kidnapping in the state of Utah. And I shared a lot of things in common with this girl that was kidnapped. She had blonde hair. I had blonde hair. We were both blonde, fair skinned. Uh, we both loved music, playing music, that type of thing. We both were Mormon. And we were both named Elizabeth. So we're going to be talking about the story of Elizabeth Smart. So in fall 2001, Elizabeth Smart first encountered a man who called himself Emmanuel. Her mom and her siblings, they were walking in downtown Salt Lake, and they came across a man who he, he seemed like he was down on his luck. He seemed like, you know, he was very clean cut, shaven. He looked like a very good upstanding man. And because in Mormonism, there's the belief in the gift of discernment that you're going to be able to feel whether someone is good or not. Lois felt good about this guy. She gave him five bucks and she ended up saying, hey, my husband has some work around the house that if you're handy, we could give you a job as well. And so, uh, you know, Jesus said to give to the poor. This seemed like a very logical thing to do. It was just her being a good woman. And so she ended up giving this man, um, yeah, that $5. And not too long after he came out to their house and he worked on the roof with Ed Smart, who is Elizabeth Smart's mother. Now Lois, uh, not mother, father. Lois Smart is the mother. So Ed Smart is the father. Lois Smart's the mother. Elizabeth Smart is uh, our main character in the story, right? So uh, anyway, Brian David Mitchell, he's calling himself Emmanuel. So I will end up using Emmanuel or Dave, Brian David Mitchell. Those are very interchangeable. So then it wasn't for quite a while, June 5th, 2002. Elizabeth is about to graduate from middle school. She is 
getting ready to go on a, a trip to Beaver, Utah with her best friend, Katie, to celebrate graduating from middle school. And it was a big discussion with her and her parents. Her brother was teasing her, hey, Elizabeth, you know why they're letting you go to Beaver? And she said, no, why? And he said, have you ever heard anything about Beaver? And she said, well, no, not really. And he says, well, now you know why you get to go there because there's, there's nothing really to do in Beaver, Utah. And so she, she made a joke to him and she said, she said, Charles, what if that's the last thing you ever say to me? And she had no idea how intense that last thing she said to him would be. Because that night she went to bed like normal. She goes to sleep in her bed and she's uh, in a shared bedroom with her little sister, Mary Catherine. Remember she's 14. Mary Catherine is nine and Mary Catherine, she, Mary Catherine, Catherine woke up to a man standing over Elizabeth and she heard something about kill and family. And she could see that this man had a weapon and that he was making Elizabeth leave. And so Mary Catherine was incredibly afraid. She ended up laying in the bed for a few hours. She didn't know if her, the rest of her family had been had had their lives taken. She didn't know if this man was still in the house. She had no idea what was happening. And finally, she got up the courage and went to her parents to let them know that a man took Elizabeth. From Elizabeth's perspective, though, she woke up to a man over her with a knife at her throat. And he was telling her to get out of bed, come quickly, be quiet. If you do anything, if you make any sound, if you try and, and get away, I'm going to kill your family. And so she did whatever this man said because she wanted to keep her family safe. And that is a recurring theme throughout all of this. I want you to just think about the fact that she was in survival mode and she was willing to do whatever it took to keep herself and her family alive. And so he ended up having her put on her sneakers that she had worn to go for a jog the night before. She puts those on and... Then he takes her for a three and a half mile hike up the foothills behind her house into the mountains where they went to some camps, a, a group of different campsites that Brian David Mitchell and somebody else had put together. So Brian David Mitchell, he takes her to this campsite and out he yells, he yells, Hepzibah. And out comes a woman. And this woman her name is actually Wanda Barzi, but she gave Elizabeth a hug, and that hug was so tight, so intense, that Elizabeth said that was not an, oh, an, a welcoming embrace. That was this woman giving me a warning that she was, you know, communicating that you are my property now. And it was just a very, very intense experience. And Right away, they started to call Elizabeth Shir Jashub. Shir Jashub is a character from the Bible. Um, it's one of the sons of Israel. That's right, a son. And so they were calling her by a guy's name. And Elizabeth was not really, she was very confused about this. She kept saying like, no, my name's Elizabeth. And they they would tell her, no, you are Shir Jashub. And so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, more about that after we talk about what happens. So Hepzibah, or Wanda, she ends up taking Elizabeth into a tent and she gives her a white robe. She's trying to give her a bath and she's trying to get her ready for something. And so she, uh, Elizabeth says, I just took a shower last night. I'm clean. Like I, you don't need to bathe me. <laughs> and so Hepzibah asked Emmanuel if that was okay that, you know, she didn't get a bath. And he said, yeah, that's fine. And then they put her in a white robe and forced her to take off her clothes, said that if she didn't take them off, then Emmanuel would come in and he would rip her clothes off of her. And so she unwillingly complied. And so she put on that robe and uh, it was, it was more like a tunic 
than like a bathrobe, you know, and Emmanuel, he came in and he said that he was marrying her, that uh, he was sealing what is sealed on earth is sealed in heaven. He used phrases that are used within Mormonism to marry himself, quote unquote, to her. Now, we know that he didn't actually marry her because he can't legally do that. She's 14 for one. In addition to that, like what legal right does he have to do that? So he didn't legally marry her, to be clear. But he married her and then he proceeded to assault her. He raped her and he ended up doing that at least one to two times per day for the entirety of her captivity. And it was an extremely traumatic experience for Elizabeth. But there are some interesting pieces of this captivity that do have Mormon roots. I, I want to just really highlight that there is the umbrella of Mormonism. The LDS church right now, they do not practice living polygamy. They do practice polygamy within temples where they, if, if somebody has a spouse that dies, they can be sealed to more than one person, which means that they would be sealed to more, more than one person in the afterlife, which means that like the eternal polygamy, it still does exist within the LDS church. However, living polygamy, people having more than one spouse in the LDS church at one time doesn't exist today. However, within the overall umbrella of Mormonism, polygamy, you know, there's like 500 factions of Mormonism, okay? Polygamy exists in, I would say, a majority of those. That's a, why a lot of them leave the LDS church is because of polygamy. Also, the fact that Wanda was going to wash Elizabeth. Before somebody gets married in the Mormon temple, they do what's called a washing and anointing. It's a ceremony somebody else washes you, but it's not today. It's not a full on bath. It's, you know, they, they graze their hand over a few different areas of your body. It was much more intense, not that too crazy long ago, but it's, uh, it's not as bad now. <laughs> so the washing and anointing. So um, Hepzibah was going to wash Elizabeth. So that's interesting. And then they wear white robes, which white robes, it's not the same style of robes, but that's something that you wear to get married in, in Mormonism. Now they ended up just wearing these white robes all the time forever, but the white robes are a Mormon temple thing. They call them the robes of the holy priesthood. Additionally, Mormons believe that what's sealed on earth is sealed in heaven. So they believe that with priesthood authority, which is their, they, they call it the authority to act in God's name, priesthood authority, men are able to seal, men, uh, seal a man and a woman together, and then their children are sealed to them, or they can seal families to their parents, that type of thing. So uh, it makes it so that uh, in their theology, they believe that they'll be with their family forever. The other thing that's really interesting, and Elizabeth, I guarantee, would not have known this because most of the most of the LDS church in my generation did not know this, and it wasn't until uh, you know the mid 2010s that we it started to really come out that Joseph Smith was actually married to teenagers as young as 14 years old. Joseph Smith is the founder of Mormonism. He also he said that he did it. He married the 14-year-old, or sorry, not the 14-year-old. He married another man's wife because there was an angel with a flaming sword that forced him to. He didn't want to take these wives necessarily. He had to. He was forced to. Uh, God forced him to take these extra wives is the gist of it. It's also important to note that there, the 14-year-old that Joseph Smith married, her name was Helen Marr. Helen Marr supposedly said to Catherine Lewis, who was a dissenter and an apostate like me, she said to Catherine Lewis, per Catherine Lewis, I would never have been sealed to Joseph had I known it was anything more than a ceremony. Now, LDS apologists read this and they insist that that does not mean that intercourse was involved. But a lot of us ex-Mormons will read that and we're like, mm, pretty clear what she is saying there. But then there's also the debate of, is this apostate just making crazy things up? Outside of the LDS group, like I said, 
many of these other factions, they practice polygamy. Samuel Bateman, Bateman named himself the uh, prophet of the of a section of the FLDS, Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. And he was recently, in the last couple of years, uh, arrested for taking a nine-year-old child bride. Warren Jeffs, also of the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, he was the prophet. And then Samuel Bateman, Warren Jeffs was arrested because he took a 12-year-old child bride. Samuel Bateman took a group of the FLDS and named himself the prophet of them. You can see that within that greater umbrella of Mormonism, polygamy and child brides are a thing. So this is not isolated. And this is not a single case of Elizabeth and Brian David Mitchell. Historically, and under that greater umbrella, it exists. So the next day, sorry, that same day, so this happened June 5th in the early hours of the morning. Later that day, the smarts, Ed and Lois, Elizabeth's parents, they held their very first press conference and Ed's brother, he worked in the media and he told Ed, you have to keep her in the media every single day. And so Ed did that until Elizabeth was found. He kept her in the media. They held daily press conferences. They did this for months and months on end. And so the very first one began and he let the world know our daughter is missing and we want her back. June 6th, the next day, Elizabeth was informed that they would be living like they were in the Garden of Eden, and she was forced to spend the day naked. And Wanda and Brian David Mitchell, they would show her and educate her and bring further light to her about what she needed to know about being married. And so she was forced to watch horrible things that entire day. She also was chained, uh, cabled to a tree so that she couldn't run away. She, there was like a padlock on there and she, she couldn't get away at all. And it was just this horrible experience. So she's gone from being this very naive, sweet Mormon girl to having been traumatized sexually repeatedly already in the first two days. And it was one of the reasons that she stayed. It was one of the reasons why she didn't run away sooner was because she felt that she was broken. She felt like this shattered, ruined, used up version of herself. She has talked about how she said that it was in school that somebody used the analogy of chewed gum and that when you are with somebody physically like that, it's like you're a piece of gum and you're being chewed up. The more people that you're with, the more chewed up and the more used you are. And so she felt like chewed gum. Now, this is a analogy that was used in young women's. Um, when I was growing up, every single person that I've talked to, they were, this analogy was used. So while she said that this was something that was taught to her in school, it's something that was taught within Mormonism as well. So that's really interesting. The other thing is bearing in mind, we've talked about this in the Jan Broberg case. In Mormonism, sex is second only to murder as far as sins go. And so, you know, here's kidnapping and sex is even worse than kidnapping, according to the theology. Okay. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So that amount of shame brought silence, gave her distance um, it, emotionally from feeling like she would ever be loved and welcomed back the way that she wanted to. She knew her family would always love her. She, ha she knew that, but she felt incredibly broken and afraid about that. The other thing that's really interesting in all of this is the fact that she was given the name Sheer Jashub. In the Mormon temple, you are given a new name, and that new name is one that you're supposed to be called through the veil in the next life. You use some handshakes to get past the sentinels to get into the celestial kingdom. So if anybody wants to call me through the veil, my new name is Rhoda. So thanks. Appreciate you. I know the handshakes. So June 14th, 2002, Richard Reesey, 
was arrested. So, you know, this is less than two weeks after she's disappeared. Richard Reese, he's arrested for a parole violation. And there's some jewelry that's found that belonged to the Smarts. The police had gone through the list of people who had worked on the Smarts home because they figured it was somebody who was familiar with the layout of the house. And because when the person did this, they found one window that was open, they sliced the screen open, and then they went straight to Elizabeth's room, got her and left. So they knew the layout of the house, whoever this was. So Richard Reese had worked on the Smarts home. And so they believed that, that he had gone in to multiple houses that he had worked on before in that neighborhood and he had stolen from them. So police felt like it wasn't a crazy step for him to go to kidnapping because he had already stolen stuff from the smarts. Why wouldn't he steal their daughter too? However, lots of other people felt like, no, actually there's a huge jump from stealing stuff to stealing a child. That's that's not the same, but he was put in prison for uh, that parole violation. In July, June to July 2002, um, Elizabeth was allowed to choose a middle name, but she was told she could not choose Elizabeth. So she chose, uh, and it had to be from the Old Testament. So she chose Esther. And, you know, it started with an E, like Elizabeth. And Esther was a queen who kind of outsmarted the, the person who she had been married to in the story. And she overcame impossible odds. And so she was called Esther for a while, and then they went back to calling her Sheer Jashub. She also realized that if she could make it so that Wanda and Brian David Mitchell, if she could make it so that they liked her, that they'd be less likely to take her life. And so she did her best to be helpful, to be cheerful, to be kind, to read all their books, to do whatever it is that they wanted so that she could protect herself and save her life. So the only thing on her mind is, what do I have to do today to survive? And that's what she would do. They had her, like I mentioned, she was tethered to a tree and she had seven books plus one that she was allowed to read. These seven books were the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Final Quest by Rick Joyner, which I looked it up and it's kind of like a doomsday end of the world, almost like a fantasy book, the literary meaning of Isaiah, which their last name, it's Hepzibah Isaiah. I can't remember what Hepzibah's middle name was. And Emmanuel David Isaiah and Sheer Jashub Esther Isaiah. So they took on the, the last name Isaiah. So anyway, it's an interesting book. They, it does go into like the overlap of Mormonism and Isaiah. Touched by the light, or sorry, embraced by the light. Um, Elizabeth had said touched by the light in her testimony, but it's actually embraced by the light. And then uh, that one, I it was a near-death experience book. The Golden Seven, it's called The Golden Seven Plus One, and it's a health book. And it's, you know, doctor who, uh, he said that the government asked him to figure out what people need to do to avoid getting cancer. And you do these seven things plus one. I don't know why not just eight, but whatever. The golden seven plus one. So you do these these things to stay healthy. Meanwhile, he was starving her. He was assaulting her. He was doing all sorts of horrible things. So <laughs> nobody's going to be healthy in those scenarios, Brian. And then the the last book was the book of Emmanuel David Isaiah. I read uh, several pages of this. It does read very much like Mormon scripture, but it goes it goes off in a real interesting direction. It is available online, but it's like 27 pages if you want to read that. So she was allowed to read those books and she read them and read them and read them and she got so bored of them because <laughs> that's all she was allowed, you know, that's all she had access to. It was listen to them, read these books, do work or be assaulted. Those were basically her options. And so Brian David Mitchell, you know, when they would run out of food, he would go down and plunder, aka shop, shoplift in Salt Lake and bring food and water back, but not, not much and not often. So she was very, very hungry throughout that all. Um, She's very thirsty through it, throughout it all. It was intense. She was able to be 
likable enough that she was untethered from the tree, but they were so high up in the mountain, there was no like escaping for her. And then one day, Brian David Mitchell, he's talking about how he has a criminal record because he pushed his mom down the stairs. At one point, he talks about where she lived and Elizabeth just super excited, like, oh my gosh, my cousin lives near there. My cousin Olivia, she lives near there. Now, she had been punished every time she talked about her family until this moment. And she was just relieved that like, she wasn't being punished for talking about her family for once. So she starts talking about her cousin Olivia. And then all of a sudden, she sees something go off in Brian David Mitchell's head. And she realizes, oh, no. And he tells her, she will be my new wife. She's going to be my second wife, really like third. I don't know why he always said second because he already had one. So she would be the third, but whatever. But anyway, so he decides that he's going to go kidnap Olivia and take her as a bride as well. And so in his different times going down and plundering and coming back, um, Elizabeth would be extremely starved and dehydrated and he would come back and he would bring alcohol. He would force her who, you know, she's Mormon. And so they don't drink alcohol. She's being forced to drink alcohol as Jesus sacrament so that he can then more easily assault her. And he would call it descending below it all. And so he would say that they had to use alcohol and drugs to descend below it all. These do come from different verses of scripture within Mormonism. But Neil A. Maxwell, who was a apostle in the LDS church, he said, Jesus descended below all things in order to be able to comprehend all things. Thus, he is not only a fully atoning savior, but is a fully comprehending savior as well. So Brian David Mitchell would use that concept that they had to experience everything in order to be like Jesus. So anyway, he would make her have lots of alcohol and she she hated it, honestly. So she's very traumatized by that. Anyway, so he did go to try to abduct Olivia um, to make her a, a wife. He went to a window that was open, but there were pictures on the windowsill of this window. And when he went to go open that window and knocked those pictures over, it woke up Olivia's sister and the whole house came running and he ran away. And he basically said that the Lord didn't want him to have this, that she wasn't, she's not the next wife because he didn't succeed. So obviously, since he didn't succeed, it's the Lord's will. When this abduction happens, remember Richard Reesey is in jail. Richard Reesey is that man that had stolen from the smarts and police. They basically said, oh, this wasn't the same guy. This was a copycat. And so they're just convinced that it's Richard Reesey and they're not interested in looking for any other leads at this point. So then August 30th, 2002, Richard Reesey dies of a brain aneurysm in jail. And he's never told them where Elizabeth is because he doesn't know. And the police basically say, well, the truth died with him. We're never going to know where Elizabeth is. And the family is saying, nope, she's alive. We're not giving up until a body is found or until Elizabeth is found. We will not stop. And they didn't. Um, so then also in August 2002, uh, they went down. Emmanuel and Hepzibah and Sher Jashub went down to Salt Lake City but they made Elizabeth wear a veil over her face. And this is in 2002, less than a year after 9-11. This makes it so that they basically, people don't want to look at them. People don't want to pay attention to them. And they can then say that, you know, anything, anything that anybody might be saying to them is because of Islamophobia, which is horrible that they were using this that way. So a homicide detective actually came up to them and, and he was like, I think this might be Elizabeth Smart. And he asked if he could see Elizabeth's face. And Brian David Mitchell said, I'm sorry, I, me and her husband are the only men that will ever see her face. So no, you can't see her face. And, you know, he, uh, Detective Richie was his name. He felt like, you know, you can't, you can't go around ripping people's veils off just because you think they might be someone. And so he walked away 
And Elizabeth uh, was afraid and had been told daily that if she tried to run away, that uh, Brian David Mitchell's friends would go find her family and take their lives. And so she complied and just stayed quiet because she wanted to keep her family safe. Um, so then because of this experience, it was such a close call. Brian David Mitchell was like, I'm getting out of here. So in September, they took a bus out to California and he, uh, th they go to California and Elizabeth said they stayed, stayed somewhere that was like the fire swamp from the princess bride. And she ended up telling everybody later about how he also tried to kidnap a 12 year old there who Brian David Mitchell, he always wanted a Mormon bride. He wanted Mormon girls specifically. So he went to a congregation, pretended to be an investigator, got invited to somebody's house uh, who had a young daughter so that he could figure out their house and see if she was the one. And then he went back to try and kidnap her, but their house was too secure. He couldn't get her. So it wasn't the Lord's will. He const constantly and consistently always wanted Mormon girls uh, because they had the right beliefs in place to be what he believed would make them good victims. So he, at one point while they're in California, he was arrested while gone um, and Elizabeth and Wanda are stuck out in the desert. They almost die of dehydration and then rain comes one day and, and they were able to survive. But then he comes back and he's just like super happy, super chill, super fine. And they were super upset that, you know, they're literally starving and he's just walking in eating some KFC. So anyway, then in October of 2002, Mary Catherine remembers who she thinks it was and she tells her parents, but the police are still convinced that it was Reesey. And so they discouraged the smarts from taking the picture public. And so the smarts didn't for four more months. So in February, they did. They put, you know, this picture of Brian David Mitchell out into the world. And this, this sketch of Brian David Mitchell, he, he ends up being identified by his sister and then also by his stepson. So his stepson, his stepson identified him and Wanda Barzi and told them that, yes, absolutely, 100%, he, they would do this. Absolutely. And so it's really interesting um, that they were able to identify him within a couple of weeks. And so everybody knew to watch for them. After a few months being in California, they got tired of being there. Brian David Mitchell said that he wanted to go back to, uh, he wanted to go to New York or Boston or somewhere. And Elizabeth said, if you can manipulate, she said it to herself, if you can manipulate me constantly, now it's my turn. So she said, the spirits just really moved on me. And I really feel like we're supposed to go back to Salt Lake, but you are God's prophet. So I really, can you pray about it? And so he did, and he got confirmation because he was so excited that she believed that he was God's prophet, right? And so she asked to be able to descend below all things and to learn to hitchhike, hoping that people would recognize her, right? And so she ends up, uh, they did end up hitchhiking. Um, they got a $1 wig, a gray wig, and sunglasses from the dollar store. And they hitchhiked back to Salt Lake and Brian David Mitchell and Wanda Barzi, they, uh, on March 12th, 2003, they were back in Salt Lake walking through the streets when the police got a series of phone calls. I think I saw Elizabeth Smart. I think I saw Elizabeth Smart. I think I saw Elizabeth Smart. They go and they separate Elizabeth from Wanda and Dave, uh, Brian David Mitchell. So she, they separate her. They question her for 45 minutes. And finally, they take out a poster. She's just denying it because she wants to keep her family safe, right? Because he has friends that are going to go get them, even if he's in jail. And so after 45 minutes of being questioned, they hold up a poster of Elizabeth Smart next to her. And they say, you know what I think? I think that you look just like her. And she said, if thou sayeth, I sayeth. Remember, she's been talking biblically for this whole time, and she did not want them to hear her being like, yeah, I'm Elizabeth Smart, right? And so 
she said, if thou sayest, I sayeth. And the uh, police brought her back. They questioned her, got her story, reunited her with her family. And so uh, anyway, if you are ever in the mood for a fever dream of an interrog interrogation, the interrogation of Brian David Mitchell that's on YouTube, wow, it is insane. So Elizabeth is reunited with her family and Barzi and Mitchell, they, they were arrested on kidnapping and transporting a child across state lines for sex. And they were able to have their trials delayed because they were deemed incompetent to stand trial. So in 2004 and 2005, Barzi in 2004, Mitchell in 2005. And so, but the, the police... To this day, they don't believe that they don't believe that Mitchell was actually crazy because his crazy only would conveniently show up in moments he needed it to. He was fine, and then all of a sudden his crazy shows up when it's convenient for him to to do so. And so Wanda, she actually did have you know some mental illness, and but there's still the religious factor here. So in November seventeenth, two thousand nine sorry, 2008, March 5th, 2008, they were deemed competent to stand trial. Finally, so they were indicted and a judge denied request to forcibly medicate Brian David Mitchell. Uh, Barzi pled guilty March 17th, I'm sorry, November 17th, 2009. Then March 1st, 2010, Brian David Mitchell was found competent to stand trial and he went on trial November 1st, 2010, and he was convicted December 10th. So Barzi was sentenced to 15 years in prison, while Mitchell, he was given two life sentences. He definitely played the crazy during his trial. He would start singing. He pretended to have seizures. He would get up and dance. He would just do everything to just throw the trial off. So since then, Elizabeth has become an advocate for victims of these types of crimes. And uh, she's had a movie put, uh, two movies put out. Um, she's had a mini series put out. She wrote her own book, um, her story. Her uncle wrote a story about her as well. And so her story has been out there and it's really powerful. It's really, really compelling. This one in particular, um, the A&E autobiography, I watched probably 30 hours of Elizabeth Smart content preparing for this. This one was the one that like wrecked me. <laughs> so if you want the, the most emotional one, it, it shows everybody's different perspectives and it's, it's powerful. She was then married to, uh, she went on a mission to France and she married a Scottish missionary that also served in her mission, Matthew Gilmore, and uh, they have a beautiful family together. She does not let her kidnapping define her, hold her back. Um, she does really powerful things in this world in spite of it all. And so in September 19th, 2018, Wanda Barzi was released from prison and she fought taking medication while in prison. Um, I couldn't find whether she ha is taking it now or not as part of her parole, but she's supposed to. And she actually lives in the same city as Elizabeth. Uh, she was released early due to a just clerical kind of error. And she lives a few blocks from a elementary school. She also was still carrying around Brian David Mitchell's writings, uh, supposedly up until she was released from prison. In February 2020, Elizabeth was sexually assaulted again on a Delta flight. And she said, I don't blame Delta for what he did. And I would imagine that she feels the same way about the Mormon church. There's that indication that she doesn't blame the church at all for what um, he, he did. She just thinks that crazy people are going to do what crazy people are going to do. Beyond not making sure that she didn't know that, you know, she wasn't chewed gum, there, uh, as far as what Elizabeth has said, there isn't necessarily Mormon ties. Obviously, my analysis is a bit different. So 
That is the story of the kidnapping of Elizabeth Smart. So some resources are in the description. I have a link for the Elizabeth Smart Foundation if you want to donate or find any of the resources that they have, or if you've been a victim uh, of sexual assault by a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you can check out ldsabuse.justiceandnumbers.com below to see if there are any ways that you can get help with that. So friend, <laughs> will you commit to like, rate, review, subscribe, or comment on your platform of choice to make the 144,000 happy? They'll make sure to remind you to come back next week for another Mormon True Crime.